Uh, we're joined by Jamie Coots, and uh, first of all, thank you very, very much for taking some time out of your schedule to have this conversation around crisis leadership and the lessons that we've learned and you've learned in emergency services and helping people apply that to their corporate lives. So, Jamie, can you give the, the viewers maybe just a, a quick rundown of, of who is Jamie Coots? Oh, wow. <laughs> Nothing quick about that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, I think a long time firefighter, uh, you know, moved all the way up to fire chief, um, now in the private world. So, uh, you know, 28 years in the fire world and, and about six months so far in the private world and, and you know, slam right into this pandemic uh, in that role. So it's been uh, interesting, you know, I think when, we, uh, when, when I think of myself anyways, I think of the, the fire side. And so uh, being, you know, in a private industry, during something like this has been a new experience for me. Um, I think back to the H1N1 and, you know, you're the fire, or back then it might've been the deputy fire chief and, you know, all of that. And 2011, when uh, wildfire burnt the town down, you know, you're at the helm. Uh, I'd only been on fire chief for a few months then. And so, you know, you're trying to learn from that and everything that happened since then. And, uh, you know, just everything has train wreck uh, right in the middle of town and Fort Mac in 2016 and uh, high level 2019. Just, I, I think more of myself as the fireside. So it's been really different to be part of a private business during this. So let's, uh, you referred to the fire in 2011 and just for obviously Jamie and I are really good friends and we'll try not to swear throughout this entire interview. <laughs> But I will. <laughs> fair enough. Um, can you uh, can you explain a little bit more around the 2011 event that obviously changed the complexity or complexion of Slave Lake and the Jamie Coots trajectory for sure? So can you uh, can you help folks understand what happened there? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, in, in 2011, uh, I'd been a fire chief for maybe about a year. Uh, moving up to that uh, that May in 2011, and uh, you know a couple fires started around town, and a couple more, and a couple more. And before we knew it, there was nine fires in the district that uh, uh, were running communities out. All right, and so ours was one of those, and so we kind of evacuated from one area into town, and then had to evacuate town out, uh, get everybody out, and uh, the fire slammed right into town. And so you know, for me, I think at at that point, our fire department, uh, it's a bit of an island. Um, you know, we're 125 kilometers away from the closest fire department, 160 kilometers away from the next one. And it's, uh, you know, we're just kind of doing our thing. It's a regional fire service and we're kind of doing our own thing. Um, you know, we had a plan. If wildfire comes a knocking, which it did, you know, many, many times, um, you know, we'd hit all the hydrants and spray water out into the bush and it would stop. Um, now, when you look back at that, you think, what a ridiculous plan. I can't believe that that was the plan that held for, you know, 49 years, but uh, it was, and we tried it and the uh, fire blew right over top of us and into the town, you know, from there it was, uh, I mean, we were rocking plan A to Z all day long uh, for about three, two weeks for sure. Anyways. So what was the first, um, you know, first, let's call it first few hours of when that happened. So obviously, you know, you go out of town and you're checking, report of smoke, you've got your son with you. And then, you know, that, that goes from zero to five trillion in probably even an hour. Right. And, and so, less, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even less. So what's, what's going through your mind at that time from a leadership perspective, because you've got Ryan out there, you've got a fire department, you've got this, well, multiple wildfires going on Like, like what's, what's going through your head for the first couple hours? You know, I think uh, leading up to it, it was just another disaster. And I hate to say it like that, but I live in an area that's disaster prone. It's floods, it's fires, it, you know, it's stuff all the time. Um, and it uh, it's kind of relentless. I know it, I live in a place where you plan to have an emergency preparedness drill every year, but you almost don't have to because it happens in real time. And so I think this was, you know, at the start, just another, this was another wildfire coming. Um, and we're used to this and, and we have hundreds of these fires start in the district. So, you know, it was just kind of watch it, see what's happening, be ready um, and, and kind of go from there. Um, then, 
you know, as it progressed, we were, we had people in one area and then another fire started on the opposite end of town, of course, how it always goes. And we send people out there and it's kind of back and forth. Uh, I, I would say that the first, you know, from 3.30 to 4.30, it was kind of a lot of planning. And I remember being at a briefing at the emergency operations center saying, you know, if nothing else changes, and I always start with that at every briefing I've ever done in my entire life. And I still do that to this day um, because we, we can only be responsible for what we know. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Better said, you don't know what you don't know. And that's just how it is. And so I always start those briefings with, if nothing else changes, this is what I know right now. And so I remember being in there and saying that. And uh, while I was in there, the wind went from about 60 kilometers an hour to 120 kilometers an hour. And while I'm in there saying that, everything's changing. And so then, you know, because a lot of people have trouble navigating that change in tempo, right? And I think crisis is characterized by this slow simmering and then this exponential jump, right? So do you remember, like, how, how are you, was there a moment or multiple moments where you thought, okay, this is not like what we thought, um, you know, we weren't planning for this or we're not in Kansas anymore. Cause I think a lot of leadership, you have that moment, right? It's like, shoot, this isn't, uh, isn't yeah. what I was expecting. Do you remember what, when that happened or, or how that transpired? For, for the Slave Lake fire, I remember exactly. I was standing on 12th street Southeast um, I'd kind of gone to the corner with one of the firefighters and I looked down the street and I was calling in another truck and there was another house on fire. And, uh, I said, Hey Ronnie, there's another house. And he kind of bent down and he looks down the street and he says, Oh, don't worry about that one. And then I grabbed him and I was like, what are you, what are you talking about, man? I'm like, you know, and he's like, Oh, that's, a, that's my rental house. And those guys moved out yesterday. So there's nobody in. There. And then he just walked away and grabbed the hose and started and, and I kind of stood on the corner and went, what, what just happened here? And, and I remember, and I don't know why I did this, but I counted 35 houses on fire on my corner. I'm standing there and I can see 35 house fires. And that was like, really, it hit me right there that, that you know, nothing will be the same again. Um, everything that we know, we don't know now. And, uh, you know, I think at that time we had around 60 firefighters. They're spread out all over the place. I'm just working on a truck. And it was like, you know what? We got to get a handle on this. You know, we can't uh, just be running around doing our best. We got to figure out what to do next. And, and so then for me, a lot of times, every emergency I've ever been to, there's an immediate or not an immediate, there's a very acute sense of overwhelm, no matter what that be, might be like a tornado response, Katrina or whatever. And so would it be safe to say that that was kind of your, you're like, oh my God, like, your oh shoot moment yeah i think from there like i would say that the next hour was just like that you know dispatch called and said i think we're going to lose power soon we got 35 more calls do you want us to tell you what they are like 35 calls in the queue and i'm like no i think i got it you know i call up my good buddy from forestry and i'm giving him a hard time about bombers and helicopters and he's like yeah you know what if we put those up they're gonna crash and i'm like yeah i didn't think of that it's too windy and uh, you know he says to me good luck and I said, yeah, you too, man. And, you know, so like all these little things just kind of start to turn into this uh, unbelievable hour of things that when you look back now, each one of those should have scared me into statue mode, right? I should have just shut down completely. Um, but really what happened instead was every time one of those things added on, um, we just went harder and faster. And, and uh, really by the end of that hour, I would say the decisions were coming so fast that I was barely able to, you know, realize that I was making those decisions. And uh, you just had to, your brain just kind of took over, your training just took over and you just start to do this, do this, do this, do this, you know. So would it be safe to say at that point, you weren't feeling stress in the traditional sense, but looking back at it, did, did stress play a major role over the first couple hours? Or is that something that you felt a little bit after that? I, I would say that I was feeling some stress leading up to it. Um, you know, once I got to that 35 house realization that it was different than everything we'd ever done before. Um, and that this wasn't in any books. Right. So there, there was, there was nothing that I could have done or read or saw before um, that could help me out specifically for what we were doing at that time. And so 
uh, really, I, I feel that it probably got less stressful. Um, you, we maybe kick more into survival mode where your brain's going faster than you can even comprehend and you're just kind of letting it roll. And the worse it got, you know, we kind of had a saying like, you know, what else could go wrong? And so, you know, 35 houses were on fire, 100 houses were on fire, 200 houses, 300 houses. Um, you know, it's this part of town, that part of town. It's jumping quadrants. And, uh, you know, at, at some point, it's just like, okay, th this is beyond anything that we've ever seen before. So let's just take a step back and start to make decisions that are good for the firefighters, good for the people in town good for that right so it goes back to that safety and it's uh, I didn't really have to do it my mind just did it and and said uh, you know go go back to some training you know so number one take care of everyone's safety number two make make sure that everyone's evacuated number three start putting out some fires right you know it, it was just uh, your mind thankfully remembers a lot of the stuff that you see and hear and read and uh, really just kick that in high gear. So when you talk to your firefighters, cause you're doing a dual role, right? Like you're doing fire chief, but you're also engaged in the field too. So you've got that going on. But when you, when you talk to the, the crews, how did they end up making decisions without you essentially? Because, you know, under crisis and, and we'll talk about it, you, there's a requirement to create like a decentralized command, you know, where you're pushing the decisions out into the field because there's just no time and there's no real rule book. So how did, how did your, how did your crews start making decisions? Like they didn't look to you to say, Hey chief, should we go do this? Like what were they thinking? What were they doing during all of this? Yeah. It, you know, I think that each fire truck kind of had its own crew and each crew was kind of its own little incident command. Um, they were operating in different parts of the town that they'd been sent to from the start. And it was kind of like hit a hydrant, grab some hoses, start putting out houses. Uh, and then it kind of turned into pull back to a safe place, grab some hoses, try and put out streets, pull back to, you know, find some places where we can defend what's going on and let the rest burn for a while. Um, and then, you know, progresses all the way to, okay, more, more help's coming and lots of it. So what are we going to do between now and then and then when they come? Um, some critical times I can remember um, on the radio, I got on the radio and I just told everyone, like, if you have to leave the line to get your family out, to, to do something, you know, to calm your wife down, to help your kids, whatever you have to do, then leave the line. There's no shame in that. If you can come back, try and come back. But if you got to go, you got to go. I mean, I, I deal with volunteer firefighters and, um, you know, they don't have to stay and help. So we wanted to know that it was okay if they had to go help their families. Uh, there was another time where I was a couple guys on our crew. I walked over to the truck and they're just screaming at each other, top of their lungs screaming at each other. And it was one of those, hey, hey, you guys, what are you doing? Like, you know, we're, we're all we got. And so stop it. There's screaming's not going to help. Crying's not going to help. Like we got each other and that's all we got. We had a little crew of four. And, uh, you know, from there, it's kind of these two weird looks. And then it's the, I love you, man. Oh, I love you, man. And, you know, the hugging and the, you know, so it was really um, weird communication. Um, you know, everything, I, I don't really remember the sound specifically, but 35 hoses on fire makes a lot of racket. And so everything was at the top of your voice. So you're yelling everything and you're trying to hear stuff that you can't hear. And so communication, I would say, in those first few hours was, you uh, it was really, you know, every truck do the best you can where you are. Um, and that was really the last command that was ever given to them uh, until later on, you know, three, four hours later, we started sectoring and kind of got our incident command going again. And, and I think, you know, it kind of has to happen that way, sadly, is, uh, you know, your officers and your top firefighters got to take over where they are and then you get a big plan and then you got to still get that out to the field. So you have that timeline that lag where the good plan takes some time to get out to the field to everybody that's out there. So if we were to, to compare this to, well, right now we're going through COVID, but this could be any crisis. Um, one of the dangers I th or one of the things I see is, is, you know, the reluctance to push decisions out into the field. And now we're starting to see a remote workforce and 
that's causing, you know, angst in itself in terms of, well, wait a second, I can't just call them into a boardroom and manage them anymore. They're sitting at home with, you know, dress shirt and sweatpants now because they're working remotely. So kind of similarly to what, what you had. Um, so what I heard you say is basically you, you give them an overall command and then you're hoping or not hoping you're expecting them to carry it out based on, based on what their training rule, like standard operating guidelines, or what does that look like? For sure. Well, it depends on the job, right? But I mean, if you sent them home to work remotely, you expect them to continue doing their job, what, whatever that job is, right? And so, you know, I, I think that some people end up sitting around going, geez, I don't know what to do, right? Um, I would go ask the boss if I couldn't think of the next thing to do. The next person is a go-getter and they're doing all kinds of stuff. They're firing off emails and they're on the phone and um, next thing you know, they're using all these different tools that are available to have meetings, whether they're in person like we're doing right now or just on the phone, uh, conferencing people in. And so it's really different and it's person to person. Um, th this is really hard on people that need to be told every step of the way what to do. Uh, this is really hard on managers that like to tell everybody what to do every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, depending on who you are, uh, if you don't need much direction and you've got a job that you can do from home, you're flying, you're going at it, you're doing great. The next person needs a lot of direction. They're not crushing it as well as that person, right? Um, and and I know, I mean, I see it on all kinds of social media every day that uh, every different kind of leader leads a different way. And, and uh, the ones that need a lot of contact and tell everybody what to do every second of every day, they're not loving this, right? Their, their leadership style is not conducive to having 16 different remote work sites and trying to go with, uh, you know, maybe some of their staff doesn't even know how to run a computer or, um, you know, to call in on the conference line or do any of those things. And so, uh, so really knowing way. what you know about leadership and, and the experience that you have, what would you tell, what would you tell managers or leaders that, do have remote workers because to your point you you've got high performers and you have low performers if they were a high performer in the office i would suggest they're probably going to be a high performer at home if they were a low performer in the office i'm probably i'm not an expert but i got to think they're going to be a low performer at home too so like how would you how would you deal with that because again in emergency services it's kind of a mis misconception that it's all centralized right like You've got one person making all the decisions, but an effective response, whether it be 2011 or anything, uh, requires pushing that decision making down. So what kind of advice would you give to, to like a frontline manager that this is new, new territory? I, a couple of things. I would definitely say, make some decisions. Don't, don't wait and wait and wait for things to happen because every single person that's remotely waiting for you to give some direction, right? And so there's a lot of uh, fear and worry in the world right now. And if you're not giving them any any jobs or any information, um, then they're they're just worried. They're sitting around. They're worried. Um, I'm not talking about busy work, but if there's things that people can do, get it out to them so that they can do it. Um, secondly, I would say is uh, think about what you really need to get done. All right. So depending on the type of business that you have or that you run, you know, is there deadlines that you still need to meet? Will those deadlines matter in two weeks, three weeks, a month? Uh, will they matter in two days? Um, you know, this thing is flying and uh, we, we don't know what's happening. The government's changing the rules every day as they learn new things. Um, you know, to me, I, I like what's happening because there's decisions are being made. Mm -hmm. Good, bad, indifferent decisions are being made. And, and we're getting them and, and we're reacting to those, right? And uh, so what, what guidance would you have around decision-making? And the reason I ask that is because there's a tendency in something like this to suffer from analysis paralysis. And, um, and, and I get the fact that you need to make decisions and you need to make good ones. But in emergency management, you almost become comfortable making a decision without all the information. And at least for me, when I have all the information, it's a red flag. Because to me, I'm like, hold on. If I think I know everything, then I am completely detached or unaware of something big that I don't know. So how, how do you, you know, do you have any rules of thumb or anything with regard to making decisions? 
Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, look at the decisions that have to get made. Like I said, um, start at yes and work to no if you have to, instead mm, of always okay. starting at no, right? Let, let's unpack that. What, what do you mean okay. by that? I, I think that there's a tendency in the world uh, in general, and especially right now when it's a big emergency and everybody's panicking, to say no to everything. Right. Um, you know, what if all these companies that are retooling their plants to build face shields and and face masks would have just said no. But everybody go home. We, we, we can't help. So everybody go home. Uh, you know, my favorite is the company that switched from making hockey equipment to making plastic face shields. Right. That's somebody that said, yes, we can do something. I don't know what, but we can do something. Right. So if you start at no, you put up a roadblock immediately that you are going to do nothing that you're not going to change, that you can't do something. If you start at yes, I'm not saying that every time you have to say yes and you have to make it work out because it just won't work that way. But if you start at yes and work to no, you'll have a lot more success and you'll probably be a lot more helpful and your people will probably be a lot happier to be with you than if you start at no every single time. And so from a leadership perspective, how can you ensure that your team starts with yes? And I suppose the first part would be outlaying that as an expectation. Um, but then from a leadership perspective, how do you continue to, to make that happen? Because I think people, when they're scared, say no, right? And so unpack that a little bit from your experience. How, how do you, it's easy to say, say yes, but you're the leader. How, how do you make that happen? You know, for me, it's hard in a pandemic because um, it, it's kind of a, a thing that you have to build your team into, right? Your team has to understand that you have an expectation that we're going to try and figure it out, right? That we're going to say yes, that we're going to, I'll, I'll take it to something I know. So um, we'd get a lot of calls all the time to say, can we come to the fire hall? We want a tour of the fire hall. And I would always say, yes, like the public is our bosses. If they want to come see this place, somebody figure it out, somebody find a way, um, you know? And so now during this pandemic, can you have people come visit the fire hall? Well, no, you can't. It's not safe. It's not allowed. Um, so there's a lot of great fire departments out there that are just having a tour of the fire hall on Facebook, right? And so uh, that's saying yes and, and meaning it, right? So, well, we want a tour. Yes, we'll figure it out for you. It might not be the traditional way. It might not be the way that you thought of it, but we'll find a way to make it work. If we just say, no, during the pandemic, we're isolated. You can't come. It's over. I don't want to talk about it. Well, that's starting at no. If you start at yes, there's ways to figure it out. There's ways to, right? What if all the health workers just said, well, no, we can't do this. Right. We're, not, we're not coming. Um, yeah. The whole thing shuts down, right? And so. And as a leader, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have to recognize that when you say yes first, the, the how may not end up being perfect or how you might lay it down. Um, do, do you think that has, a, has something to, for, is that something for leaders to respect as well that, you know, it's going to happen and it may not be perfect, but it's going to happen. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, during this, just think of all the people that the no people that started at no, I can't run this company from home. You, that person can't work from home. That person can't do this. And, and then here we are. There's hundreds of thousands of people working from home. They're making it work. They're figuring it out. They're trying to, right? It, it's like the first group of people that had to lay people off, right? That's sad. Nobody wants to do that. You know that that means it's going to hurt your business and it's your team. You don't want to let your team down. And um, But then it's happening hundreds of thousands of times. Then it's happening millions of times. And it's not you and it's not your fault and you didn't do it. But you have to, as a leader, grasp that and say, okay, well, how, how can I keep some things going? How can I keep some people working? Um, you know, if I have to let them all go, when I bring them back, how does that look? What's going to happen? And so leadership is, uh, you know, it's really dependent on what you're doing and what your company's had to do to survive all this. But um, it doesn't just stop because everybody's gone, right? Yeah. yeah and, and so with regard to that, that's probably a good segue into something that you would have a particular um, perspective on. And that is, how do you look after people during, but more importantly, yeah, during crisis? And, you know, in the case of Slave Lake, you're dealing with individuals that lost their homes, 
you're dealing with friends, you're dealing with all of these things. And so what kind of things did your team and your crews come up with in terms of stress and, and those sorts of things? And then that will lead us into a conversation of how you can, how you supported them through that. So what are some things that, that your crews experienced emotionally and, and mentally both during the crisis and, and right after it? I think you always have to remember that the people are the most important thing, right? Without the people, it doesn't move. Nothing moves, nothing happens, right? So for us, um, you know, the firefighters that lost their houses, once they knew their families were safe, there, there's nothing else they can do, right? You're not going to rebuild your house overnight. You're not going to figure out your insurance overnight. You're not. And so they really just wanted to stay part of the team. They wanted to stay in the fight and, and try and that's great. You know, and we let that happen. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, we protected them as best we can, not sending them into those neighborhoods and, and really, uh, you know, starting and finishing every day with debriefs, having counselors available, uh, breaking down all those stereotypes and just saying, hey, if you got to talk, you got to talk. Um, you know, how many people out there right now in their benefit packages have these emergency people that they can call these counselors and, and how many people are using that? right? We're kind of a, well, we'll tough it out society and we don't really need to be. Um, you know, I tell people all the time, if you need to talk, talk, but I mean, I'm not a counselor. So if you need more than I can help you with, call the professionals. Now, are they getting overwhelmed? I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, the people are the most important thing. And even once we've had to lay them off, you have to stay in touch. You, you have to keep talking to them. You have to, how are you doing? Um, you know, and it's, uh, it's the simple things like you could say, well, how's the money situation? Well, you're laid off. We know how the money situation is, mm -hmm. right? So they've put a bunch of things in there to try and help people with that. So, you know, as the leader, what do you do? Give them those pointers, pay attention to that stuff, follow along, right? Did you defer your house payment? Did you defer your, um, truck payments? You know, did you apply for EI? Is there something I can do to help you with that process? Here's the phone number to call. And it's not, you know, we just don't cut it and quit and that's the end of it. Uh, as the leader, you, you know, you have that responsibility to continue to lead even through those tough times. And that's hard because you're trying to lead your family. You're trying to lead other people. You're trying to help make sure their families are okay. Um, you know, you might have the bosses calling you to say, hey, we got this other stuff going on with the company. You know, you're still trying to do stuff with less or, or uh, figure out how you're going to restart again if you're going to be able to restart again. And, and I get all of those stresses, but at the end of the day, um, you know, when you're a company or when you're a leader, your people have to be the top priority. 